right now. I just want to talk a little bit about ethnobotany and clinical botanical medicine, um, which for me as a naturopathic physician is where I continue to use my ethnobotany education and bring it to the medical students that I work with. So just to get you caught up on a sort of trends, we're not calling it uh, complementary and alternative medicine anymore. The National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health is the, the new name. So calling it complementary and integrative medicine is, is sort of the, the latest term. Um, this study of the graph on the left shows uh, the use of so-called CAM in this, use of CAM by age category. And uh, you can see that the, the highest use is actually in ages 50 to 59 years, so sort of the, the late boomer um, generation. And they did a follow-up study based on this information that they gathered in the National Health Interview Survey. Um, they did a partnership with NIH and uh, AARP to see whether people were reporting CAM use or CIH use to their doctors. And this actually showed that only um, a third of people were reporting these to their doctors. Um, and this is out of all study participants. When they looked at people who actually used uh, types of alternative medicine, and they included everything from a vegan or vegetarian diet to chiropractic to acupuncture to more you know, esoteric things as you go. But um, in people who actually did use that, about four, only 42% of those people were reporting its use to their doctors. So there's kind of a disconnect. When I'm talking about doctors, these are people going to their primary care MD or DO um, uh, physicians. So a lot of the use is not getting reported. Um, there's also been some changes in the rates of use of herbal, um, herbal medicines. These are the, the top 10. So fish oil, you can see there's still a higher rate of use, and that trend is currently upward, um, while others have dropped off or stayed level. Um, overall, there's still about an 18% prevalence in the use of uh, non-mineral and non-vitamin dietary supplements. Um, but with the population continuing to grow between 2002 and, and, and 2012 when these numbers were, were gathered, that still is an increased use of natural products. Even though things are relatively stable, population continues to go up and so does use. Um, so there's an increased demand for natural products and there are more integrative and complementary practitioners who are coming onto the scene in a response to people's <coughs> increased demand. Um, there are a lot more uh, people practicing uh, this you know, style of medicine where they're incorporating um, herbs as well as supplements and other types of we call them modalities, just different types of treatments. Um, so naturopathic medicine is uh, you know, my specialty. So really a primary care type of medicine is how we're, we're all taught as generalists. That's how we teach our students to come out to be ready to practice in a similar style to a family medicine doctor using evidence-based medicine, using traditional approaches um, such as hydrotherapy. Um, we, we learn counseling. Some people may do extra education, acupuncture, and that kind of thing. But so botanical medicine is, is our firmest foundation. When they surveyed naturopathic physicians, 50% of them were using botanical medicine. Um, when they looked at just uh, by numbers of visits, so 50% of all visits included botanical medicine prescribing. So as you can see, we are introduced in the blue states and then the green states are where we made. No. <coughs> so this is the license and regulated states. We have 17 uh, licensed states, then uh, Puerto Rico, the U.S. Virgin Islands, and Washington, D.C., um, and then uh, five provinces yeah, um, here just radiating from B.C. to Ontario, and then active legislation in the green states um, to, to push for licensure. So the idea of licensure is that anybody who, um, who qualifies for a license has, has passed a national licensing examination. That national license exam includes um, over 10% in botanical medicine prescribing. So my actions, indications, contraindications, interactions between herbs and drugs, between herbs and nutrients, um, and a whole host of, of other content that's part of that exam. Um, so, Part of the education that the students receive, uh, right now we have what's uh, been termed an integrated curriculum. Integrated is everywhere. Um, it's a case-based curriculum used uh, at, at most U.S. medical schools where they're incorporating botanical medicine prescribing <coughs> into uh, basic understandings of various diseases and conditions. So it's really fully integrated. And then they have a separate um, track of, of five uh, 
lab courses over the course of, of two or three years, depending on the program, um, where they have just devoted lab time to creating botanical medicines and creating botanical formulas. So these are some of our, our best year students hard at work in our dispensary and then also in our, in our herb lab. So learning to actually prepare tinctures, teas, salves, ointments, you name it. Um, botanical literacy is a really essential part of naturopathic medicine, uh, not only because of um, the number of supplements that people will put themselves on. I've, I've seen more than once somebody bring in a shopping bag full of different dietary supplements. Most of them are herbs, um, and so that's, that's been termed polyherbacy. Um, other conventional doctors are used to managing polypharmacy where people come in on 20 drugs. We see that as well. But also with the addition of you know, 20, 30 different herbal supplements that people are taking, um, some of which can be really dangerous. So it's important that our students learn how to manage that and how to um, it, you know, take people off of these, these uh, types of um, dangerous uh, uh, interaction causing supplements. So how does this tie into conservation? So sort of within our naturopathic oath that we take um, as a profession when we graduate, um, here you can see this is one of the founders of our university, and everybody you know, stands up and takes the oath together. Through precept, lecture, and example, I'll assist and encourage others to strengthen their health, reduce risks for disease, and preserve the health of our planet for ourselves, our families, and future generations. So a little different than the Hippocratic Oath, we have a, a clause that includes conservation directly in it. Um, when we actually survey the field, though, only 66% of naturopathic physician practices include some type of uh, conservation, including recycling and reduction of medical waste. Uh, when we look at where naturopathic physicians um, send their money, um, the top groups are linked to conservation, Sierra Club, Environmental Working Group, the NRDC, uh, WWF, and the Organic Consumers Association are sort of the top charities that naturopathic physicians actually give to. So you can see where sort of the, the ethos lies, you can see where our philosophy leads us, but again, at only 66% who have sort of just an active recycling program as part of their practice, we can definitely do better, and we can encourage medical students to be um, conservation-minded. So part of that, what I've done for the last six years um, since I started a naturopathic medicine program uh, is uh, medical field botany, medicinal field botany. So I take groups of about 20 students out to the field, these sort of awe-inspiring places that we happen to have in Washington, like this is Mount Rainier, um, this is actually paradise at Mount Rainier, if anybody has been there before, it really does live up to its name. We say this hike for the last hike of the last day. So I thought it was good to shave my last hike is the last talk of the last day. <laughs> so this is sort of an overview. This is just a couple of, of our driving routes. So we're up here in, in Seattle as well as up here in Kenmore at Best Year. Um, we'll, this is a rainy year down here, so you can see it's about a four hour drive from where we are. We also do sort of this grand loop through the Central Cascades um, over Stevens Pass and then down to Yakima to sort of the dry side of the desert. So we're crossing a number of biomes. We also go across to uh, the Olympic Peninsula where there's another set of um, alpine biomes, uh, wetlands, <coughs> that sort of thing. We try to cover sort of the major um, sites in the state. Um, the students learn about species associations, so a marmot, this kind of species associations, just, you know, being able to see old growth forests, these really grand cedars that we have. Um, here's, here's grouse, here's some, you know, Lutkia pectinosa as a partridge and grouse in the same picture. Um, my students uh, also get to go to the tide pools. Um, we see just sort of these different environments. You can see here we are. Uh, um, this is up uh, climbing at, at Paradise. Um, and then we go to a coastal environment. This is on uh, Whidbey Island. So really we're trying to just give a, a broad overview of the medicinal plants that are grown in the region. We harvest all along from places where we can harvest. We make medicine at our campsites at night. So the students are really experiencing the full understanding. Okay, so we went and we hiked this far until we finally saw this plant. Is this a common plant? Should you be giving this to all of your patients when you graduate? Probably not. Um, they really get an understanding of what type of environment we use this to discuss sort of the more esoteric angles of herbal medicine when we talk about energetics, we talk about traditional use and give the history of the area. 
For example, um, Evie's Landing was an important point of contact between um, Native Americans and the first uh, explorers of the area. Um, we talk about some of my, everybody here likes plant pictures, so I thought I would give you a few. So the duck bill louse wort pedicularis onethobrinca and the sickle top louse wort pedicularis rusimosa. We talk about other ecological issues. Both of these plants are hemiparasitic, therefore it's important not to harvest them near poisonous plants like lupines that could cause um, a preparation made from these plants to be quite toxic. So we talk about uh, multiple um, dimensions of that. This, this is also a fantastic plant that's native to the Pacific Northwest um, and is used for uh, pain relief. So we get to discuss sort of you know what to do at the end of a long day of hiking. Um, the answer is not to harvest this because this goes in the National Park. Um, and then we have mountain bog gentian again. They hike all day to find this. Um, OSHA law, we talk a lot about the ethnobotanical uses of that. Um, these are just sort of the, the common ones that we encounter um, on our trips and just these sort of lovely pictures. Um, the students really get sort of enchanted and excited when they, when they find these types of plants. You know, gentian is one that's used really commonly in a lot of western herbal formulas, but when they realize we had to drive four hours and hike three miles until we found it, they're a little more reluctant to use it um, as they'd like to. Um, so the, the more inroads that we have to, to conservation with naturopathic physicians, um, really increasing conservation within the profession, it's already built into our oath, it's built into our ethos, it's built into what we already are doing. I think we could increase the efforts within the profession. Um, and then educate our allied health professionals. So many people are interested in providing herbal medicines to patients. So many providers can go in and take a weekend class and then from there we'll, we'll start giving herbal medicines without an understanding of some of these other issues. People are giving things like um, UNCA, um, which is um, the, the South African Union, if you're not familiar with it, um, in not understanding sort of the um, economics that go into that um, and the conservation uh, need there is for it. Um, so naturopathic physicians, we, we're a very, very small field. We're only about uh, 2,000 licensed physicians at the, at the last <coughs> estimate. Um, but by those numbers, we reach probably 1.2 million patients a year. Uh, next week, we're graduating another 400 physicians. So our numbers are continuing to grow, and in 10 years, we're projected to reach 10,000. At that point, it's going to be a much larger reach and a um, much greater chance to educate consumers. Because as uh, Steve pointed out, it's really buyer beware when it comes to supplements, knowing what's safe, knowing what's sustainable, um, and knowing what, um, what makes sense with, with what your health concern actually is. Um, and then lastly, just a plug for vitamin N, N is for nature. So if you've ever seen those commercials, like ask your doctor if nature might be right for you. I don't know if anybody has seen those. Uh, these are just recent news articles saying doctors should be prescribing more gardening, um, forest bathing is the new yoga. So, you know, getting more exposure to nature shows that it reduces stress levels. It increases, you know, feelings of well-being and happiness. So it's sort of an emerging area. And just the other day, I wrote on a prescription pad for someone to go walk barefoot in the grass because she felt she could give herself permission to. Mm -hmm. So it's, sort of, it's, it's a really kind of, it's a different way to go about, a, you know, a day in a doctor's office. I just want to put a plug in for that. <laughs> Um, I just want to acknowledge um, the people who have helped me so far, um, and there's my little dog at the end. <laughs>